Even if everything were optimum, the viability of the system is measured in the hundreds of years. And remember that we've only begun to practice this as if we were maybe uh, two to five years old uh, as a humanity. 10,000 years out of 200,000 years. We're babies. We really are learning how to do this, but some of these lessons are coming hard. We're resisting the lessons about what agriculture really is, what we need to stop doing, and what alternatives we need to start finding. So let's switch gears, and this is my most potent argument for why we need to be thinking of an alternative to the system that I've just described, which again, the majority of us experience as beneficiary. So, it goes like this. Let's talk about who makes up this country. And this goes to how we all experience the food system differently. And it goes to the social breakdown that all of us are experiencing by living in this country, and in really all industrialized countries. It's a phenomenon that is not an accident. So let me start out by illustrating for you the demographic breakdown of the country. So two-thirds descendants of Europeans. 13% descendants of Africans, uh, less than 1.5% descendants of the first people on the continent, and then about 17% this broad category that is just labeled here, Hispanic. Now, plotted against that, poverty. And the reason to plot that is that in a cash economy, if you are poor, you will be hungry. So this is a good proxy for the hunger rate in all industrialized countries. The first thing to point out is that there is white poverty, and all of you know what these pockets of poverty are in this particular nation. They're concentrated in Appalachia and in the South. Um, generally speaking, they're not constrained to those areas. But the next thing to note is that you'll see that there is a disproportionate rate of poverty, thereby hunger, among the nation's population of color when you look at the demographic breakdown. It is not proportional. And again, this is not incidental, and it all has to do with the food system. It, all of it has to do with the food system. So let me justify that while praying. I want to end up by stating again, it'll be repetition then, and I hope it'll be more the second time you hear this. These are not unfortunate people. So just take a look at how these people have come to be in the condition that that graphic describes. So these days, we're sometimes horrified when we talk about the land grab that we see happening all around us. The, the, biggest one that most of us probably were outraged by was the Crimean land grab on part of Russia. But these land grabs are happening all over the place, and Central Africa is one of those places where there's a hot spot of competition for land on the dynamics that I just described, a lot for agricultural purposes. So the First Peoples experience an explicit and intentional campaign, not only to remove them, but to eliminate them if possible. There were five million of them at the time of European, uh, let's call it politely settlement in the United States, and what is now the United States. So in 1830, the formal campaign began. It was a matter of national policy. Many of you remember that that year is the year that Jackson proclaimed and Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. So that Congress evidently was less sophisticated than today's Congress, you know, because today's Congress there's no humor in this, but everything has to be about jobs. It probably would have euphemistically called it the Native American New Opportunities and Jobs Act. But the 1830 Congress was very explicit about what they meant to do. The Indian Removal Act began systematically removing the southeastern tribes, moving them to the other side of the Mississippi, and as the Department of the Army, as it was called then, documented, there are over 200 instances of battles and massacres where systematically this was carried out from the 1830 to the conclusion of the Apache Wars in the southwest of the United States, and finally, the massacre at Wounded Knee in 1890. And there's Chief uh, Bigfoot, which the military uh, photographed. These, by the way, were all elderly people, women, and children who were performing a ritual post dance and were massacred defenseless. So the fact that these people are some of the poorest, purposeless, immiserated people is not an accident. And this is some of the most immiserated people on the planet, not in the United States. You just need to visit some corners of the Navajo Reservation. You just need to go to Pine Ridge these days in order to be able to witness that. I'll talk to you a little bit more about the price to escape from that, if you believe that there's a way to escape from that destiny. 
but it's basically to acquire their land that this was uh, pursued. Fred and I uh, spent quite a bit of time in Iowa, and I taught uh, both Iowa farmers, I mean farmers, the adults, and their children. These are salt of the earth, you know, heart of gold individuals who can look at you straight in the eye and make this claim. We are so blessed to have this land. So I'm not going to address the religious aspect of that. I'm just going to tell you, I know there were very deliberate actions taken within four generations of where we are right now that explain why that land is in the possession of the United States. So bear that in mind, the acquisition of land, the first factor of production to explain why we have some of the demographics and the poverty rates among the population of color in the United States. Then secondly, let's add on to that the second factor of production. So not only was acquiring the land the necessity, somebody needed to produce the menial labor, to perform the menial labor, the actual drudgery of agriculture. At the time that the colonies were established, the business of agriculture was a mercantile model. And so first the sugar cane, then the tobacco, then the cotton, and to this day this continues as the rice crop, were major crops that were produced in the southern part of the United States for export to Europe. They were very laborious crops. And so the plantation owners were not going to perform that labor. And so you know that a very global system for the time was established in order to provide that labor. So for a period of 350 years, methodically, families were affected, rent asunder, transported under the most inhumane conditions across the ocean, 12 and a half million of them continent-wide, about nearly five million of them ending up in what today is the continental United States, brutalized, exploited, treated worse than animals, considered not to be full, full human beings. For almost 350 years, it was the business model of agriculture. That's what agriculture was at that time, those crops that I mentioned. And you can be assured that at the time of emancipation, these were the people that knew the most about agriculture in total not just those plantation crops. You can be assured that those plantation owners did not produce their own fruits and vegetables. And remember the date at emancipation immediately after the Civil War in the 1860s. The Midwest had not been populated yet, if you're thinking about that store of agricultural knowledge. The population, the demographic that knew most about producing food and about agriculture in the United States was the nation's African-American population. And they were repressed and further excluded from continuing to work as free men and women in agricultural practices. Even promises about 40 acres of meal were broken in order to keep them under submission. So even after emancipation, what we have done as a nation is to systematically exclude the descendants of the people who were stolen, brought to this nation to perform the brute labor of agriculture Systematically, I repeat, excluded from benefiting from the wealth that their labor helped to create. To this day, if you know how to read the headlines, you know that the message is still being strongly sent. We didn't create this country for you. You need to remember your place. Uh, I need to come back to this point and repeat. If you know how to read the headlines, you know very clearly what we're saying to the sentence of our menial laborers for 350 years. So again, there is an explanation for in the real world game of serpents and ladders that we have a whole population that has not experienced the food system in the same way that those of us in this room would normally tend to describe it. Now, you can't get over something that isn't over. And slavery has only evolved. It has not gone away. It is migrant labor who are responsible for the fact that the majority of us can drink milk and eat apples and have lettuce and salad. Those migrant laborers know, and they speak of it on these terms, slavery has only evolved. Now, let's talk a little bit about the cudgel that makes this possible. This is another one of these points that I want to come back and, and, and put into agribusiness terms. But the cudgel is this. You sometimes have to ask yourself if conditions that I read about in the Sunday paper now and then for farm laborers are so bad and they're immigrants, what must it be like for them where they come from that this is better? 
So remember that question, and I'll come back to it. That's not an accidental feature of the system, again. But here's the cudgel that we use. Because of the fact that Americans will not deign to do this work themselves, after number one, there is a demand for this agricultural labor. Now think about what we've done with rules that we've written for the global economy. We've made them up. These are not like the laws of physics or thermodynamics. They're absolutes about the universe. They're true whether human beings are here to observe them or not. We've made the rules of economics. And in those rules, recently, we've made it so that capital can be fluid. It can go across borders, be invested and harvested across all of these borders. We've made it so that we can trade materials, so things can go back and forth across borders. Um, we had an incompetent president at the time, doesn't understand these basic rules of economics, but this is the rules that we have written. Third aspect of this is labor does not enjoy that feature of the rules that we've written. Labor cannot flow freely across borders in response to supply and demand. Because if that were the case, then it would be an asset that there were people coming across the border to perform labor that we either are not capable of supplying ourselves or are not willing to perform ourselves. So the fact that we consciously make these folks illegal when they respond to that labor demand gives us the leverage to be able to exploit them. The exploitation looks like this. They can be threatened with deportation if they act up at any moment. They are not paid livable wages. They can be subjected to working every day of the year without a break. It's a laughable proposition that they should expect workers' benefits, workers' compensation, retirement benefits. There are exemptions, remember, exemptions to agricultural labor laws that allow the children of migrant workers to work in the field as young as 12 years of age when every other child is expected to be in school. It's an exemption. We know exactly what we're doing and to whom. Those little fingers are good for picking berries and fruits like that. So slavery has evolved, and that's the cudgel that we use. Now, here's a nice summary of this. I think it's a sad thing when a comedian can say more accurate things about this than some of our leading politicians. But just read what Chris Rock has to say about this. I used to work at McDonald's, making minimum wage. Now, you know what that means when someone pays you the minimum wage. You know what your boss was trying to say? It's like, hey, if I could pay you less, I would. But it's against the law. <laughs> Now, those of you that are familiar with the wages and the mechanisms that we use to pay migrant laborers less than the fair price of their labor, their contribution to the agricultural system, know that we can circumvent this. The, the system mostly is labor contracting and layers in between the farmer that actually needs the labor and the people that are actually performing the labor. So, I told you we would come back to this and I'll repeat this and I hope it means more to you now. These are not unfortunate people. These are not underserved people. It is not an accident that these folks don't experience the food system the same way that we do. And let me put a fine point on it. Those of us that are in these demographics that help build the agricultural system of this country, it is our land, it is our labor to this present day, are very clear about the fact that the rest of the population sees us as being here to serve you and not as part of the nation that we help to build. Now, that has to be a palpable reality. It's something you both understand and you feel and you don't want to live with if you want to transform the food system. It can't be something that those of us in the three columns to the right feel and not everyone else. So, let me say one last thing about this topic and then try to conclude this and make you happy again. So, um, you all recognize this statement. You know, the one where we recognize all that statement. Um, there's one line in there, the, the one that says that all of these rights accrue to, and it says, all men. And that was a literal statement, especially land-owning men. The benefits that were written by the original colonists were specifically ascribed to land-owning men. It was only until the 1850s that non-landowners throughout the entire nation, it was a progression, could actually aspire to vote. 
It is scandalous that it wasn't until the 1920s, after almost a 100-year struggle, women were given the vote. And even though nominally by law, African-American men could vote after emancipation, you know that there are still active voter suppression efforts to this day, somewhat alleviated by the Civil Rights Act, but two years ago reversed by Chief Justice John Roberts, saying that because civil rights have been successful, we no longer need it to protect voter rights. So it is very clear that that statement that I made to you, the country created for colonists and that the descendants of colonists experience in a different way than the people that provided the menial labor to build the country experience, has all of the features that I just described. Now let me just be clear, and again in the spirit of making us all feel good, uh, I'm describing decisions and actions that our predecessors made. Those of us in this room may be beneficiaries of that. It's one thing if we were unconscious of that benefit. If we're conscious of that, then we should behave differently. And it's up to all of us to make a different future than the trajectory that our predecessors left for us. We have the freedom to do that. We have the ability to do that. So that's one of the lessons of this. Now, let's tie this back to the prior, um, the introduction to this, which is this premise that the modern agribusiness sector is essentially formalized plundering and cheating. So I think I, you've seen some of the elements of that argument, but the cheating aspect may still be a mystery, especially if you aren't from the business sector and you want to uh, believe in capitalist economics and the uh, theories that if we are all free as buyers and sellers to make the decisions that are in our best interest, that through competition, we make the best decision for everyone, buyers and sellers. That's one of the core assumptions of capitalist thinking. And I want to use the example of this particular business, which has become the largest grocer on the planet, as you all know. And they, they propose to do this and accomplish it in a very short period of time. <coughs> so, you know that their business model, if, if you want to talk to me about their sustainability practices after we get done here, I'll talk to you about those. Uh, they're a separate topic. They're motivated by different concerns. But I want to talk to you about their business practices when it comes to food. So they're generally regarded as a low-cost food provider. That is true. How they do that is by squeezing the supply chain. You all know that. So they don't operate by market principles of supply and demand. They decide what the price point is that they want to offer their clients, and then they operate with everybody down the supply chain to say, you must meet this price point if you expect to sell to Walmart. That is what condones poor prices to everybody along the line. And it gets worse the more you get to the beginning of that line. Farmers are exploited by the system, and farmers can't do right by the labor that they hire if they don't have enough money in their economy. So the line of exploitation flows all the way down the value chain. So wherever they move in, of course, because people are responding to this cheap food thing, they go flocking to them, and local or regional businesses or whatever the pre-existing business model was then goes out of business. So those kinds of scenes you can see all over the place. And Fred, I don't know if you will recognize that, but that's North Grand Mall two years ago, names. So uh, you don't have to stretch in order to be able to uh, find these sorts of examples. And so let's go inside one of these stores and see what goes on there and what the cost of cheap food is. So um, you all are familiar with this uh, statistic that is often used horribly, horribly out of context and, and to make points that are just not supported by the reality behind the numbers. And it is the cost of food per household as a share of disposable personal income. Phrasing it that way is very important because the way that it's more commonly stated is that we enjoy the cheapest food supply in the world. It can be words that are biggest lies in the world. It is one of the most expensive food systems that there are on the planet. But if you phrase it this way for reasons I'm going to explain to you within two minutes, then the statistics bear out a reality, which is that the proportion of our household income that we need to spend for food has been decreasing. In years recently, in the last decade, it actually has gone below 6%. But it's fair to say that it's around 10%. So this seems to be a benefit of the food system, right? So right, all of these things, maybe we, there's things that we need to refine, but look, we don't need to produce our own food, and we need to spend a very little amount of what we earn in order to provide for our food. Who would not want this? So let's dig a little bit more behind that. And remember that this is a ratio. 
the proportion of what we earn, specifically the disposable income that we need to expend on food. So um, I, I'm embarrassed to patronize you by pointing this out, but whenever you have a ratio, if the quotient is large, there's two ways that that quotient can be large, right? Either the numerator is teeny, the cost of the food in this case is low, or the denominator is really big, we earn a lot, or both things are true. That's how you get that kind of a quotient. So which is it for the United States? So let's take a look at what has happened with income growth. It has flattened uh, since the financial crisis. But in essence, you can see that the trend is that our income growth has been pretty constant. And I'll show you another view of that in just a little bit. So that the answer to this question really is, when you look at the absolute cost of food in the United States, we end up spending roughly, this is just uh, closed numbers, about $5,000 per household. Remember, the income per family is a little bit over 50000 in the United States. So that, that has been fairly constant. So what that ratio really tells you is not that our food is cheap. It tells you that we're really rich. The United States as a country is really, really rich. Now, I, there's a punchline to this that I want to come to, but we first of all need to explain something. This is a global system. You mean the prices that we pay in the United States are the same prices everyone else is having to confront if they adopt the system. And you know this system has been adopted the world over. If you travel a lot, you know that there are still some places in the world where you can choose which food system you're going to participate in. And the United States, we're trying to resurrect that a little bit. But in some parts of the world, you can still go to the authentic local and regional food system, and you'll notice there that the prices for higher quality food are vastly lower, and order of magnitude lower than what you have to pay for the equivalent article that the global food system supplies you. Stands to reason. Remember all the logistics that are required. If it's December in New England and you want an avocado, you can have your avocado. But the price for that is going to support everybody that made that happen. And if you don't feel that that's expensive, it tells you how rich you are. It doesn't tell you how cheap the avocado is. So let's take a look at how this manifests globally, and then I'll come to that punchline here. So I'm going to show you a pattern here. So this is the global comparison of these data that I just showed you here. So there's the average household income, and then the percentage per FAO, or Food and Agriculture Organization statistics that we must expend for our food. Now, let's do that for all of these other countries here. And while this populates, let me ask all of, or explain, or provide information for all of you skeptics in the audience. These are not cherry-picked data. You see the source of the data up there. It's the database. It's called uh, FAOSTAT. So you get the nice, very convenient, searchable database that you can go to on your phone if you like. Uh, now, I did select these data so you could see the range of these values in these different countries. So you can see that in the UK, the average family earns about half, less than half of what the average family in the United States spends, but they spend the same proportion of their income on food. Look at what a country like France does, 14% of their income on food. You notice it's dramatically different when you get over to a country like Mexico. So their average family income is 5,000 US dollars, and they need to expend 22% of their income. And take a look at Kenya. So Kenya has an average family income of 541, <coughs> excuse me, and half of that needs to go to their food. They're participating in the global food system. So here's what, for the skeptics, I need to answer. The standards here are the the level of 2,000 calories, so micronutrients, other factors are not in. So, and uh, this is purchasing parity adjusted, so that it's fair to make these comparisons across the globe. Now, one thing I want to point out to you: you can see the arithmetic here. Um, in the United States, we spend. Let's just round this up. You'll see why I want to make this easy uh, for our calculation. Let's round up our food expenditure to 10 percent. 10% of 51,000, let's round that to 50,000. Let's just say $5,000. Now divide that into 541. Now do this. You know that we waste 40% of our food. So 40% of the 5,000 food expenditure divided by the 541 that it takes a family in Kenya to eat 
If you're doing the arithmetic, let me just tell you what the punchline is. Your trash can eats better than eight families in Kenya do on an annual basis. Your trash can. And yet, we do not feel that. Do not even think about that. You know what it looks like? That banana on the counter for three days no longer looks good. It goes into the trash can. That's what it looks like, among other things. Depending on which country you're in, some of this waste can be on the production side. In a country like the United States, that waste is definitely once it goes from the grocery store and into our homes. So, uh, there are some realities about the way that the food system operates and the waste that is built into it. Uh, there are a few things where I said already, if you remember nothing else, well, I'll apply it to this. If you remember nothing else, waste is not this incidental feature of the system that we can kind of tweak and make the food system better. It's built into the way that the food system works. It's required for it to work the way that you experience it. So, this wasteful system, what can we do about the social inequity, the environmental impact, the waste? Let me uh, give you just one more example of a place where uh, we need to rethink the way that the whole thing works. In the United States, the value of the food system is approaching two trillion, and the world as a whole is approaching five trillion. So, um, the foreign value of this is 17%. It's above that. If you sell something like uh, milk, uh, it's below that if you sell a non-differentiated commodity like wheat or corn. It can be like four cents if you're doing that. Um, so let me just make this statement really clear. That is not cheating everybody, at least if we accept the system as I've described it. It accurately reflects the contribution of those farmers to the food system. And one way of understanding it is to stack that food dollar against the value that is added so that, as Coca-Cola likes to say, whenever you desire something, it's within desire's reach. The food system doesn't necessarily provide you food. Yes, it does that, but it's incidental. Here's what the food system does for every one of us in this room, the likes of us. It's saving us time. It's making it convenient. It makes it so whatever we want, you know, repeat that statement that somebody I made earlier on. Whatever we want, how much we want, whenever we want it, whether it's negative, whether it's in season, doesn't matter, you can have it. Now, it doesn't happen by magic. Here's the system that's required to do that. Now, this is a cartoon that Sandra Levy did once that I found really, really useful to explain this good point. So, really, if farmers want to earn more of that food dollar, as you folks are, some of you, yeah, I don't know, specifically those of you that work at Stone Barns are experimenting with, then you need to deliver more of that value. And remember, the value is saving people time, making the food system more convenient. So there are some ways that can be done, uh, some ways that that can be done. This particular way of doing it is through a CSA, or uh, direct marketing. <coughs> particular way of doing it is to work at the level of um, fruits and vegetables that you can provide uh, yourself directly to a regional market, therefore keeping most of the dollar to yourself which you're eliminating here, all the processors in between, or if you want to work with other farmers and aggregate that supply, you know, that you can contribute to a food hub that will also allow you to keep more of the food dollar to your uh, farm. Now, here's the comment that you're all familiar with when these kinds of systems are not only proposed, but actually implemented, modeled around the world. There are some of these that are very successful. One of the very best examples of these that I know of is nearby, many of you may know of it, and it's common market in Philadelphia, driven by social equity concerns, but run by two Wharton graduates that really know their business chops. So if they're making this thing work, here is the common response to this. Well, yeah, that's not going to feed the world. So here's the ultimate question we need to answer, and it is this, this fallacious thinking that the system that I described may have all of these negatives euphemistically, or evils, even more frankly. But what are we going to do? we got to eat, and we're not all going to produce how much food. So we can't rely on these cartoons of a food system. We need, you know, the big steroid, big ad in order to do this. So let's deal with that.